Hello there YouTube, Devin here again. Have another video for you. This one's gonna be a little shaky because I'm off the tripod uh tripod because I have so much to show you here and it's so kind of spread out. And adjusting the tripod and everything for that would be a little awkward as well as trying to arrange all that stuff around me so I could reach it and still maintain audio capabilities were a little bit hard. So I've tried this a different way and it's just gonna have to be a little shaky for this one until I find a better solution. Um but what I have for you is a review on the Canadian battle dress. Now, the Canadian battle dress was basically the same as the British pattern for the most part. And it served from through World War II, uh, through Korea, and basically up into the 70s with cadets and stuff like that, possibly even longer. I'm going to show you all the components I have here today. This is set up for a primarily Korean War impression. And I don't have any insignia on this yet because this is pretty new. I have one other set that's British. Uh, I couldn't fit all of that out here to do this. I might do the British one later, but because I've been hinting at kind of working on a Canadian project, which is just off camera right over there, I just don't have all the components yet. I figured doing the Canadian one would be uh, a little bit nice for the, the Korean War impression. So I have most of the parts here. Some of them aren't quite correct, and not all the stuff is the correct dates and stuff like that, but they, this hardly changed through its whole lifespan. Really none at all basically. And we're going to uh, go over some of that here today uh, as far as what I have and everything like that and uh, some of the different variations you can see. So what we have here <coughs> is the Canadian battle dress uniform. Uh, and we'll start up here with the hat. Now this is the Korean War era hat. Um, it's Basically, uh, the same as the World War II version, with just uh, an add chin strap, a little bit more comfort, a flexible bill, and everything like that. The neck and ear flaps fold down. It has a plastic liner in the top. As you can see, this one was made by Buffalo Cap and Neckwear uh, Limited. Uh, it's a size 7.5. Now, Buffalo Cap is in um, uh, Ontario. And uh, they made a lot of these hats. Most of these are actually referred to as buffalo caps because they made so many of them. Uh, has a leather chin strap and has little uh, Canadian insignia buttons with little maple leaves in them there. And uh, this was kind of the standard headgear for the uh, Korean War and the era after it. It became so associated with it that, like I said, the name buffalo cap stuck. And it was, uh, it's a really good hat. Now, I recommend if you are buying one, see, I normally wear a seven and a quarter, which is about a size 58 European, and I had to opt up a size because this cap is insulated uh, with the wool here, and then the ear flaps fold up, it kind of constricts a little bit, as well as it shrinks a little when it gets wet. So I opted for a size larger. Uh, I actually do have a size seven and three eighths as well, uh, but that just wasn't quite enough, so I went to a uh, a seven and a half and it's a very good hat it's a very good winter hat uh, and it has a little spot up here for you to put your badge on this little front tab part is was carried over from the world war ii design so you could put your uh regimental badge on there now, i haven't decided what regiment i want to go with yet i know the 25th was really the only thing in korea but i kind of hopefully plan on using this for multiple uniforms so i'm trying to devise a way to get different eras worth of patches on here and make it look authentic but still have them be quick changeable and I'm working some stuff out on that so but we'll get into the uh, the top here now the top is basically uh, what's called like an Eisenhower design here in America uh, but a battle dress design uh, for pretty much the rest of the Commonwealth now the Canadian ones differ from the rest of the Commonwealth in the fact that they're distinctively more green um, most of the Commonwealth ones are, are very brown. Uh, the Canadian ones, as you can tell, are, are distinctively, they're distinctively more green than the rest of the other uh, co uh, Commonwealth pattern ones. And they also all have concealed buttons. Uh, so the buttons kind of do the US style where there's this uh, cotton liner that you see there that is stitched in little increments to where the pockets have there. And they're bar tacked in between the buttons so you can button them up. They have steel buttons. Uh, steel uh, slider here for the adjustment of the waist. Uh, this jacket sits very high. It cuts off at about belly button height as it's supposed to, and this is uh, about a size 42 inch chest. Uh, it is unlined as you can see. And down here at the bottom, it is designed to integrate into the pants. Now the pants have three buttons in the back on the outside, so you can hook this 
into the pants and essentially connect the pants to the shirt and it gives you a little bit uh, of uh, in the way of load carriage as well as uh, extra insulation and stuff like that. Now this one was made in 1965 but like I said they, they hardly ever change uh, as far as it goes. Now I'm a little bit taller than 5'7", five, 5'8", five, but they do make these a little bit larger and the pants basically come up to like your chest. So uh, the height isn't so much a worry about as long as you're getting the right height to match your arm length. And so uh, that this works for me. So comes pretty. It's a little ever so slightly short, but that's uh, not really too too bad for me. So uh, now the pants uh, are kind of the same uh, as the standard British battle dress as well. Uh, as you can see, same steel buttons. Uh, wool, same kind of thing where they have the pockets where you can conceal the buttons. Uh, it has integrating spots for uh, suspenders, once again with steel studs. Uh, the suspenders are made out of cotton and elastic. This is like the traditional elastic, has a leather uh, back Y strap cut there. Uh, solid brass hardware on everything, sliders on them are solid brass, uh, which is how they would have come for pretty much both world wars. Now, like I said, uh, here on the outside, there are the three buttons, one, two, three, for integrating into the jacket. Now you can see they're a little bit off-center from the belt loops, but that is all right. The belt loops are designed to actually be just ever so slightly off-center uh, because it wasn't really used uh, because your jacket would cover this part of the pants up anyways. Uh, but you could use a belt uh, if you really wanted to. I, I like the suspenders and I don't really have a need for the belt. Um, the cuffs of the pants uh, have dual adjustment as far as securing the cuffs, which is uh, good for attaching the gaiters. Now these are the pattern 37 gaiters that would go over the boots. Now these are kind of a later set and they're the darker green, kind of like the uh, OD-107 that the Canadians really started to issue in the 50s, uh, kind of the early 50s when they switched over from the pattern 37 to the pattern 51 all their canvas gear basically started to become this color. Um, but you can see pattern 37 in use for a long time, even after that takes over. Now the pants also have the one pocket on the left thigh, on the front of the left thigh. Once again, it has a concealed button. It's just a large pocket. It's obviously referred to as the document pocket where you would keep all of your, your documents and stuff like that. Now, the boots that were used for the most part were ammunition boots. Um, most of the Canadian ones, I don't have a Canadian pair just yet. Uh, these are DMS boots, which I wear uh, when I'm doing a lot of indoor activities uh, and stuff like that. If I'm going to be playing uh, airsoft indoors or something, or if I'm going to be uh, showing this off indoors, or let's say it rains or something, I usually keep these in my car to wear indoors because they won't. Uh, gouge the floors out like these ones will. Now, the only difference between the Canadian and the British ammo boots, for the most part, is um, they didn't have the toe caps. A lot of the Canadian boots didn't have the toe caps, which was pretty common for wartime designs of ammo boots, for them to, you know, save the leather and not put the toe cap on. But the Canadians just stuck, you know, stayed with not putting the toe caps on after the war even. So, but these weren't always what were issued. Now there's this other boot called uh, the what they often referred to as the third uh, division boots, which were basically American uh, double buckle boots, um, kind of single pa place. They're like the French Rangers, but rather than having two buckles like this, it only had one on the side, and they would have been black. And rather than having rubber soles, they would have been hobnailed. But it's not uncommon to see uh, them using British boots either, as far as like attrition rates go. Uh, Canada didn't send a lot of troops to Korea, so they ended up, eventually, most of them, getting uh, American cold weather gear. You can see them in Pattern 51 uh, parkas and, you know, the sateen jackets, which are kind of like an, a pre-model uh, pre of the M65 field jacket. Uh, you tend to see them in, eventually, uh, M43 double buckle boots uh, as well, a lot of pictures and stuff like that. You can see them using kind of a conglomeration of uh, British and American and Canadian gear throughout out the war as it kind of went on uh, with a lot more heavy emphasis on the American stuff because it was easier to get because the Americans were bringing tons of supplies and stuff in as well. So you see a lot of uh, Canadians eventually ending up with American gear even to go as far as M1 helmets uh, towards the end of it. 
So that's basically an overview of the whole Canadian battle dress uniform. Uh, I This isn't getting super in-depth to it because, like I said, I have so many parts and stuff that I'm missing and so many parts just here even and there's more parts to it and everything else like that if you want to get into belts and different suspender types and ever so slight changes throughout its lifespan but for what I have which is like the Korean War era this is a pretty good representation because there was such a mix match of stuff that was used and issued in this era because it was a big transition period for Canada as well so hopefully you like this video you subscribe if you like this sort of thing if you have any comments, questions, concerns, additional information, user experience on any of this gear, feel free to leave that down in the comments and I will do my best to answer them. Um, and we'll go from there. I'm trying to hopefully make a few videos here for you. But once again, the work schedule is just being a bit rough on me. So thank you for bearing with me so much. We're about to cross 900 subscribers, which I, I never expected to make it to 100, to be honest. So thank you all so much for that. And I'll see you all in the next video. Bye.